so um, there is, um, we know that there is a template for the protocol for simple meta-analysis, but this is not enough uh, for a systematic review with multiple interventions. And therefore, uh, there is, uh, an, we have already uh, worked on items that need to be um, added or modified in the case that we have multiple interventions. So here in this paper, um, we have uh, we have described with examples all these items, and uh, actually there is also um, a, a, a plate in Revman under preparation, and hopefully it will be ready soon, and people will be able to use it. So um, first, uh, at the protocol stages, it's very important to set the rationale for the review. And uh, the first step is uh, when we prepare the title of the review, it is very important to be able so uh, people to, to identify it as a review with multiple interventions. Uh, we need to clarify then why a network meta-analysis is necessary. For example, it might be because uh, there is a lack of many direct comparisons between the treatments of inference and therefore indirect evidence will be valuable or uh, might be because uh, the investigators aim to rank the treatments. But it should be clear why it is necessary to perform a network meta-analysis. For example, uh, here we have a protocol for a network meta-analysis that compares different safety, uh, the safety of different anti-epileptic anti drugs. And so they wrote uh, to justify the, perf uh, the performance of the network meta-analysis that uh, some AEDs have been associated with increased risk of harm, but there are inconsistent findings that regarding their harm. And so they aim to evaluate the comparative safety of AEDs uh, for infants and children, etc. So it is clear that they want to resolve uh, the inconsistent findings that exist so far. So afterwards, as it is in any meta-analysis, we need to define the PICO. But what it is important in the case of network meta-analysis is that when we define the PICO at the protocol stage, we need to keep in mind the transitivity assumption. So we should, uh, we should have in mind that there is one major assumption that underlies network meta-analysis. And it has two aspects, the conceptual definition, which is called transitivity, and, the, and its manifestation to the data, which is called coherence or consistency. You can find it with both terms. So a few words on what is transitivity. So um, let's consider again the three treatment loop uh, that we had before. So uh, the underlying assumption of transitivity uh, says that when B versus C says that it is valid to, cal to calculate B versus C, uh, through, uh, through A. So um, the validity of network meta-analysis depends on the transitivity. And in, mathematical, in a mathematical form, it means that the advantage of B over C equals the advantage of B over A plus the advantage of A over C. And in simple words, it requires studies to be similar in ways other than the treatments we compare. And there are different ways to think of transitivity. For example, uh, one way is to consider whether the anchor treatment, so for example, treatment A, whether it is similar when it appears in A, B studies and A, C studies. For example, consider the case that uh, A is a placebo and in A, B studies it is given as uh, injection and in A, C studies it is given as pill or consider uh, if A is given in a different dose in the AB studies and in a different dose in the AC studies. So we need to consider carefully whether it is appropriate to combine these two different versions of the A treatment or not. For instance, uh, this is an example where uh, the placebo in each study was not the same because uh, this network compared different fluoride treatments and uh, so the comparison between fluoride toothpaste and uh, fluoride rinse um, can be made via placebo, but the placebo of toothpaste and the placebo of rinse, it's not the same. 
And so they might not be comparable uh, because the, the mechanical function might have an effect on the prevention of caries. And so in this case, the transitivity assumption is doubtful. So it is clear so far that the definition of the nodes in the treatment network is a quite challenging issue. So at the protocol stage, we need to consider uh, whether transitivity is plausible for the treatments that, and the populations and the studies that we want to compare. So for example, we can consider whether the missing arms are likely to missing at random. This means uh, that we know that the AC trials do not have the B arm and the AC trials do not have the C arm. Is this, we should consider whether, whether this is a reasonable scenario. For example, sometimes uh, it might be impossible uh, in the AC trials people to, to, um, to get the treatment B. So for instance, if we have an intervention, uh, if the interventions are given in a sequence, then the missing arm might not be given at random. Then we should consider whether the treatments are what we call jointly randomizable. So uh, this means that the treatments need to be uh, genuinely commit, competing alter, alternatives. So for, uh, we should be able to consider a big randomized trial that compares all treatments in the network. Of course, this in practice is impossible because we cannot have a randomized trial comparing 20 treatments, but in theory, it should make sense. For example, let's say we have a first line and second line chemotherapy resonance. We know that first, first stage patients wouldn't randomize in a second line regimen and second stage patients wouldn't randomize in a first stage regimen. And then we should consider whether the distribution of possible effect modifiers uh, is similar across the different comparisons. So a priori, we should identify the potential effect modifiers. And once we have the data, we should compare them to see whether they are distributed um, similarly across the different, the different comparisons. So these are characteristics that have to do with the patience of the studies, uh, the trial protocol, the different doses, the different administration, etc. So all these characteristics should be similar in ways uh, that might modify the treatment effect. For example, let's say that AIDS is an effect modifier. In the first case, uh, the, the distribution of AIDS in studies comparing placebo versus B and the studies compared to placebo versus C is similar. So the mean and the variance are similar. In the second case, we can see that the distribution is very different. So in the second case, transitivity is violated. So what we should keep in mind when we define, when we consider what interventions we will include in the network. We should restrict, uh, if we restrict the, re the review to compare few interventions, the advantage uh, is that um, we, it is easier to defend transitivity, but on the other hand, this limits the usefulness and the applicability of the review. Um, the risk to have an unconnected network is higher. And we also, since we have fewer data, we have lower power of the analysis. On the other hand, if we expand uh, the network and we have uh, many treatments, then it is much more difficult to defend transitivity. So the, the transitivity assumption might be violated or at least it will be much more challenging to defend it. And also, uh, the, the, the whole uh, process of the review is much more difficult. The data management and uh, the analysis plan is much more difficult. We should be very careful when we uh, define the eligible interventions, uh, when we have old and new treatments, because for example, old treatments might be included only in old studies and new treatments might be included only in new studies and several things might have changed uh, from studies published 20 years ago up to now. For instance, the baseline risk of the, of the participants might be very different and if baseline risk affects there is a, the treatment effect, this uh, should be considered as a potential um, variable that might violate uh, uh, the assumption, might make these studies incomparable. Uh, or we might have add-on treatments, uh, intransitive legacy treatments, and so on. 
So um, another issue is that at the protocol stage, we need to consider what we will do if we identify new interventions. There might be some very new public, uh, very new interventions that we don't have in mind. So we should define whether we plan to include also these interventions or not. And also, we need to, to define how we are going to deal with different doses or different drug classes and co-interventions. So, uh, for example, uh, we can merge the different doses or split the different doses. So th this depends which assumptions are more plausible. So overall, when we uh, think about transitivity, we should follow these steps. So at the outset, so before at the protocol stage, we need to consider whether the treatments we want to compare are in principle jointly randomizable. So whether they have the same indication, uh, and as I said, whether it is uh, in theory uh, reasonable to have a very big trial comparing all the treatments in the network. Then. We should look at the once we have the, the, the studies and we have extracted the data, we should look at the studies and we should compare uh, the distribution of the effect modifiers in order to see uh, whether they are similar across the different comparisons. Um, of course, sometimes the, we don't have the data and this is uh, an important issue. And later, once we run the analysis uh, of the data, we should consider, uh, we should, and uh, we should run several tests to see if direct and indirect evidence are in statistical agreement. And so this uh, evaluates the assumption of, of coherence, so the, the statistical assumption. Okay, is there and any questions? Yeah. yeah, I was going to say, I've got some questions on transitivity. Um, okay. So what happens if the transitivity assumption is doubtful? Would we have to stop the network meta-analysis? Would it still get published? How do we tackle that? Um, well, if we believe that transitivity is likely to be violated, then this means that our results might be invalid. So if we are not sure uh, whether transitivity is plausible or not, we might continue, uh, move on to, to do the analysis if we don't have very important concerns about transitivity, but we should be very careful, careful uh, on, on how we will draw the conclusion. So we should um, report all the concerns that we have about the plausibility of transitivity in our conclusions, and we shouldn't draw very strong conclusions about the relative effects. But if we have strong concerns, concerns about transitivity, then probably we shouldn't analyze um, the data. It's, it's the, it's the, uh, the analogous uh, con concept of clinical heterogeneity in a simple meta-analysis. We can consider it in this way. Thanks. Um, should most of the details of, um, of A, so a, a treatment A, between AC and AB be the same, such as dose and duration, et cetera? So this again, uh, this depends on the clinical setting. It might be that for a, for a specific uh, outcome, the dose is not so important, so we know from the bibliography or from the clinical experience that the uh, different doses do not give very different results. And in another, uh, for another outcome, uh, we might know that the dose is a very important uh, characteristic of the intervention. So this, this should be uh, evaluated case by case. Again, the same with the duration. Uh, if, the, um, if the duration of the treatment is expected to, to modify the effect of the treatment, then uh, we might not, uh, we might con should consider whether it is uh, reasonable to combine the different durations. But in other situations, it, it might be plausible to, to consider that the duration does not play an important role. And at the, at the end, we can also do some sensitivity analysis and see whether different types of analysis give different results. Okay, um, there, there are quite a few coming in here. Um, could you elaborate more on grouping doses or similar classes? Um, I think you you possibly covered that one. Um, so there are several 
So there are several options how to, to analyze different doses or different classes. So um, the two extremes are either to consider them to merge everything so uh, and to do the analysis at the drug level. And the other extreme is to do the analysis at the dose level or um, uh, at each different variant of the intervention, let's say. And then there are some um, models in the middle that they allow, however, these are a little bit more advanced uh, statistical uh, models that they require uh, modeling from the statistician. They allow to, to make assumptions what happens uh, within a dose or within a class. So for example, uh, we can assume that um, uh, within, uh, within uh, so we have, let's say drug A, and we can assume that within drug A, as the dose increases, the effect of drug A increases uh, using a specific pattern. Um, or we can assume that the different doses have the same, uh, are what they call uh, exchangeable. So they have the same mean, they, they all follow an, uh, a common distribution, so they have the same, the same mean, but the, there is a variance in their, in their uh, effect. So they don't have exactly the same effect, but they have similar effects. So there are different assumptions that we can make uh, if we don't want, if, if we believe that uh, both merging them or consider them completely different uh, are not reasonable assumptions. <clears throat> 